Welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced at North Idaho College on the shores of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe, addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart, in welcoming today's guest. Welcome to the beginning of the 36th year of the North Idaho College Public Forum. As far as we can understand, that this program now is the longest running college produced PBS program in America, so we're happy to welcome you to the 36th year. We have a two part program to start out our 36th year, and it's a very important topic. Unfortunately, we haven't heard as much about this as we should, and the title of this two week series is Shadow Over the Constitution The Attack on Judicial Impartiality and Independence. We could not be more fortunate to have such two distinguished guests to discuss this very important subject. First, I welcome to the program Dean Don Burnett, who was born in Pocatello, Idaho, and he received his BA, magna cum laude, in economics from Harvard. He holds a Doctor of Jurisprudence from the University of Chicago and an LLM degree from the University of Virginia. He's helped many distinguished uh, physicians in the field of, of law. Uh, he was a clerk to the Chief Justice of the Idaho Supreme Court, Assistant Attorney General in our state. He entered private practice in Pocatello and later served as President of the Idaho State Bar. He served as a district judge in eastern Idaho and was appointed to the Idaho Court of Appeals and was elected to another term there. Uh, in 1990, our guest moved to Kentucky and became the dean at the University of Louisville, uh, Louis uh, D. Brandeis School of Law. And uh, fortunately, he came back to Idaho and he now serves as the dean of the College of Law at the University of Idaho. Uh, dean Burnett, welcome to the program. Thank you. Pleased to be with you. Let me just add one note to your introduction, which was very generous. I did not serve as a district judge before going to the appellate court. I went straight from practice to the appellate uh, court. Sorry, I. Thank you. The list is so long and impressive, I, I just made that mistake. Um, and the, our second distinguished guest is um, uh, also equally distinguished. We welcome to the program Justice Linda Koppel Trout. She grew up in Boise, Idaho, and she holds a BA and Dr. Jurisprudence from the University of Idaho. She served as a magistrate judge and as acting trial court administrator for the Second Judicial District and was district judge. I got you and the, and the dean confused. Uh, where she served all courts with, with distinction. In 1992, she was appointed by Governor Cecil Andrews to be the first woman in the history of the Idaho Supreme Court as a member of that court, and she also holds the honor as serving as Chief Justice of that court for two four-year terms. Uh, she has recently retired from the court, uh, but again, uh, a distinguished record in law. Thank you both for being here. And I'm so pleased to have our two regular panelists, Janelle Burke, who's the Attorney of the State of Idaho, Next to her is under Reinhardt, who is the Director of Public Relations at North Idaho College, and Janelle will come in today's question. Dean Burnett, my first question will be for you. Would you please uh, begin to set the stage for our discussion today and identify the issues by telling us what the differences are between the branches of government under the Constitution? Well, as set forth in the framework of the Constitution created by the founders 220 years ago today, on the day we're taping it, the legislative branch, and to a large extent the executive branch, were thought to be political branches. Uh, although they didn't have quite as direct an election uh, process as we have today, there was a linkage between the electoral impulse and the policies and the uh, activities of those two branches. But the founders thought that the third branch would be different, that the third branch of government, the judiciary, would be grounded in the rule of law, that it would protect the separation of powers, that it would uh, safeguard rights against uh, entrenchment by either of the other two branches or even by a majority. This idea of protecting the few from tyranny of the many while also protecting uh, the many from tyranny by the few is the great American experiment. It's the great innovation in our constitutional system. And it requires, in order to be effective, that the third branch of government be independent but more fundamentally, that it be impartial, that it be grounded in the rule of law, that it be neutral, that it be open, and in that regard, it is fundamentally different in its orientation and purpose from the other two branches of government. Thank you. Justice you've had an opportunity, uh, or you are uniquely qualified, to talk about all the ways that we might have of selecting state judges in our state, but many other states have similar types of processes. But could you please walk us through your career 
and the ways in which you have become a judge and a justice. And it, it, that also sets the stage for our discussion today as to how judges are selected. Thank you, Janelle. I would be delighted to do that. Um, I originally became a magistrate judge in 1983 and went through a selection process by a magistrate's commission and was appointed. I then sat through two what are called retention elections, a yes-no vote on whether or not I would keep my seat as a magistrate judge. Then in 1990, a position came open on the district court bench here in Idaho, and I ran in a contested election against an attorney and happily was elected to that position. And then in 1992, uh, as was mentioned, I was selected by the governor to sit on the Supreme Court. I went through a selection process uh, that position as well, meeting with the Judicial Council, going through an interview, and then my name was one of four names that were submitted to the governor for ultimate selection. Uh, I then had the opportunity to go first through a non-uncontested election in order to retain my seat on the court. And then in 2002, I was challenged by an attorney, so I went through a contested election, happily was uh, re-elected to the position. So I think I am unique in Idaho in having been the only judge who's been through every selection and election process that we have for judges in Idaho. Senator Reinhardt. Welcome to the show, both of you. This is truly an honor for North Idaho College to be hosting both of you on our campus today, so welcome. Um, I want to start with Dean Burnett, please. Justice Trout kind of walked us through the state system, and what I'd like you, for you to do, please, is explain how there must be other systems in the United States that other states use, and let's just touch on that for a few minutes, and then maybe also speak about how federal judges are, are selected. Well, let me go in reverse order. Federal judges are uh, nominated by the president, and they become judges upon the uh, consent of the Senate. There's no uh, formal pre-appointment uh, screening mechanism, uh, the, although the president is encouraged to consult with the American Bar Association. The American Bar Association renders a report, but it doesn't have a formal uh, governance role in the process. Uh, that causes the process to be rather political right from the beginning. Uh, many states, including Idaho, have uh, judicial councils or judicial nominating commissions that review applications of individuals seeking to serve in the judiciary and look at their merit, look at their integrity, look at their intelligence and their legal uh, capacity, and look at their willingness to be impartial on the bench send a uh, list in Idaho for two to four names, as uh, Justice Trout was mentioning, to the governor, and the governor appoints from that group. In some states where this uh, merit selection process exists, there is also then, either by that same nominating group or another uh, blue ribbon group, an evaluation of judicial performance, which then precedes a vote of the people from time to time on whether a judge should be retained in office or not. Now, another system, which we have partially in Idaho for some judges, and like Justice Stratton, I've been on the ballot too, we allow judges to be subjected to contested elections. Somebody can run against them as opposed to being on a retention ballot in which the question is yes or no. There are a few states, principally in the Northeast and among the oldest states, that appoint judges uh, for either very long tenure or nearly life tenure similar to the federal system. So you see there's quite an array among all of the states in addition to the federal system. Excellent. And Justice Trout, walk us through maybe with a few more details about what your process was when you went through the appointment to be appointed as a district judge through the Idaho Judicial Council. What kind of criteria do they look for when they appoint a judge and how that process works? Uh, and actually, that was to be on the Supreme Court. Thank you. Um, they look at a variety of different things. There's typically a, a poll done of attorneys that discusses things like temperament, intelligence, wisdom, uh, compatibility of outside activities with those of a judge, uh, writing skills, all of those kinds of qualities that you would normally associate with a judge. In addition to that, the council has uh, information on whether there have been any complaints filed with the State Bar Association. If the candidate is a judge, as I was, 
There is information on any complaints made to the Judicial Council about the judge. Uh, in addition to that, there's a criminal history report, if any. Uh, credit history is obtained and uh, information on the candidate whether or not they are current in filing their income tax returns. So there is a wealth of information given to the Judicial Council confidentially that the Council has before it at the time that it's conducting the interview to get, I think, a pretty thorough and detailed idea about the background of the candidate. And the council then makes a recommendation, is it to the governor, who yes. then appoints? Yes. Is that mm -hmm. okay. they, they recommend between two and four names. It's up to the council, depending upon the number of qualified candidates, how many they give to the governor. But, but those parameters are set, and then the governor is the person who makes the actual selection. Okay. It's very important, to, in Justice Trout's answer to your question, former Chief Justice Trout, that you didn't hear that there was any litmus test about a philosophy. Now, these criteria all relate to the individual, the integrity, the capacity to be impartial, the, the ability to do the work, industriousness, and, and individual characteristics. But a merit selection process is not designed to impose a philosophical litmus test. Judges are not supposed to be pursuing a specific philosophical agenda. Their job is to uphold the law. And one of the uh, concerns that we have that gives rise to this program and to other uh, presentations that the Justice and I have made is that uh, we're not doing a good enough job of a civics lesson with uh, the citizenry to acquaint them with the importance of impartiality. Uh, folks sometimes think the judiciary is just another political branch of government and ought to have viewpoints and ought to be subject to the same political processes. And frankly, that is just dead wrong. That's where I'm getting my <laughs> question. As a political scientist, I was, I was fascinated with those presentations and going back and studying the creation of our government. As we sat here, as we said, it's the 221st birthday, um, September 17th, um, of our Constitution. And it certainly was set up very different uh, for the judicial branch. As we look today at the fact that the president, the vice president, the Congress elected, there was no intention to elect the judiciary in the federal system to give it to that independence, I would argue. Uh, Dean um, Burnett, would you take us back to some of the comments of, of Hamilton and Madison and others? Uh, you just said such a great job today talking about the Republic. And, and from that time, bring us to now about what you see as the dangers of uh, uh, this very, very important, uh, not an idea, not a policy, but a constitutional principle of the independence and partiality of the court system. Well, thank you. The, uh, uh, the Federalist Papers, authored by Madison and Hamilton principally, John Jay wrote uh, three of the uh, Federalist Papers, but Madison and Hamilton the rest, really focused on, as I was uh, mentioning earlier, the importance, uh, and this is my phraseology, protecting the few from uh, the tyranny of the many, the so-called uh, tyranny of the majority, and protecting the many from the tyranny of the few, undue concentration of power. And the, the system was set up so that power could not be unduly concentrated. We have laterally dispersed power among three branches of government, and we have vertically uh, separated power between a national government and now 51 uh, state jurisdictions, including the District of Columbia, plus some territories. So power is dispersed in order to avoid that concentration of power of the few over the many. But then by enumerating rights in the Bill of Rights as part of the process by which ratification of the Constitution was attained, we built in the notion that the government cannot override certain basic rights, even at the vote of a, a transit majority of the moment. If it violates the Constitution, it's, if it violates the Constitution, it's the affirmative duty of the court to say so. Right. Uh, that's a very important uh, point in deciding how you should select judges, because if you want judges to be impartial, and they should only be independent if they are impartial, and not have their own philosophical agenda that they're going to pursue on the bench, then it is important for them to have uh, the kind of security of position or at least a, a public understanding of the role of the judiciary so that once in a while they will have to stand for the rule of law even if it's unpopular at the moment mm -hmm. or even if a, can't, if a litigant in the court is unpopular at the moment. Mm -hmm. Justice Pratt, I'll have you to follow up on that in the fact that 
and, and we're going to get into some actions across the country, states Supreme Court elections and all that, but let us suppose that, as we're seeing it, that if special interests are getting involved in the election, and they will only support candidates if those candidates say they stand a certain way on issues, what does that mean for the future if people come on to the court at any level, like the state Supreme Court, and they've committed themselves to certain ideas and policy before coming on the court? Can there be any impartiality with those particular justices? Well, one would hope, first of all, that if a judicial candidate is announcing views like that, that a complaint would be made to the Judicial Council, because that would clearly be a violation of Canon 5 of the Judicial Canons mm -hmm. of Ethics that binds all candidates as well as all judges. So one would hope that a candidate would think about that before they went expressing these views. But I would also hope that th there's a, uh, a technique, I guess I would call for lack of a better word, called recusal that enables a judge who feels that for whatever reason, either personally or because there's a perception that they may not be able to sit fairly, that they can excuse themselves from consideration of an issue. One would certainly hope that if a judicial candidate had expressed these kinds of absolutely concretely held views, that if that same issue came before them, that they would recuse themselves from consideration. Because I can't imagine how the public and how the litigants appearing before the judge would have the perception of fairness and impartiality if and the judge had done that. Let me follow up on that. Let's, say, let's take State A, uh, and they have seven members of the State Supreme Court. And over intense campaigns and lots of money and special interests, four of the seven get elected to that court with really specific issues. And I'll ask the dean to talk about the White case in Minnesota, which makes this possible. What's going to happen to that state if four of the seven have committed themselves and anyone going before that court that has a, a different interpretation of law or policy would have no chance. Does that not destroy checks and balances? Well, it certainly does, and it, it certainly destroys the public's confidence mm -hmm. in our government. And, and I think that it affects not just the judiciary, but I, I don't see how it could help but impact the public's view and confidence in the executive and legislative branches. And I think there would be a great deal of cynicism about, well, why should I even bother to appeal or appear before that judge? Uh, Dean Burnett, I would, in all due respect to the voters, <laughs> and I love democracy and elections, but in all due respect to them, most voters are not that tuned in to what we're talking about concerning the judges, and they don't know them like they do candidates for governor and so forth. And if there's intense campaign television in particular, and it appeals to the majority of the voters, and they don't understand this impartiality, uh, isn't that a danger that they, the voters will be tempted to go down that road? Well, it is a concern. Uh, I'm not an exponent of doing away with elections, yes. uh, because there is no perfect system. Elections have advantages and disadvantages. But in contested elections, particularly where judicial candidates have to raise money, uh, when where third-party advocacy money comes into play, as we have seen happening in neighboring states and indeed in, in Idaho in one of the Justice Trout's own races. We have uh, efforts to convince the, the, uh, the populace to elect judges with a, almost a contract for certain outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the candidates are, uh, have a very heavy inducement to give pledges and promises the way other politicians do. And if an individual then later has a case before that judge, how much confidence is that uh, litigant going to have in the impartiality of the judiciary? It's very difficult to take human beings and put them through a partiality gateway and expect them to come out impartial on right. the other side. Right. Can you help her? Let me just introduce the subject that I want to talk about, which is the most recent things that are happening. Uh, Justice Clark, uh, you can speak, I think, about perhaps 2000 as a watershed year. And can you bring us up to date on what sort of happened in, in state courts throughout this country uh, based on the judicial election? Well, what we're seeing, and yes, you know, you're right, 2000, it seems, was a watershed year in terms of the campaign fundraising that went into Supreme Court races throughout the nation. Uh, a dramatic, in fact, a, a double increase over 1994 
Uh, and I think what we're seeing is more and more special interest groups becoming interested in electing their justice to the Supreme Court in each of the states. And I think Idaho has started to see that. Nationally, that certainly is the trend. And more and more groups are raising more and more money and putting more and more money into television ads and other forms of advertising to try and sway the elections uh, in order to get a particular candidate that they view as being of their viewpoint elected to Supreme Court. You know, it's sometimes hard for people to see what's wrong with that. Um, don't we have majority rule in this country? Isn't that what a democracy is all about? But the framers of our constitutional system did not create a simplistic democracy. They created a constitutional republic in which there were separated powers and there was a charter, a document, a constitution, which would constrain the powers of the uh, branch of the government and differentiated the judiciary from the other two. And it's very important why that occurred. If you think about the situation of an individual going to court, an individual usually does not have the choice about going to court. They get sued and they get accused of something by the government and they're dragged into court. Um, they aren't dragged into the legislature to advocate something. They're usually not dragged in front of the uh, executive branch with regard to the promulgation of regulations. But they are in court because somebody put them there. They also have a very specific personal thing that is uh, being adjudicated, the custody of a child or who owns a particular piece of property. And the judiciary is also constrained. The judiciary is the one branch of government, this will be a double negative, the judiciary is the one branch of government that cannot decide not to decide. You can go